be God. <laughs> I always like that title. It's like, here, Lord, go for it. <laughs> it blows my mind because a lot of people don't expect God to speak. They would rather take the time and emotion to pass it off to someone else. For instance, going to church. People like to criticize or challenge or hold in some form of judgmental way something that a pastor might say. But God says that he placed people in authority above us so that we could be responsible to God by being accountable to a person above us. Because if we can do that to the obvious fallible person we see, how much more so can we do so to God whom we cannot see? In other words, what you see is what you get and God put him there, so be direct. So if you expect God to speak to you, then every day you go to the Word and you look forward to hearing God speak. If you don't expect God to speak to you, then you might be going to churches and doing a religious thing and criticizing people for the way that they may present things, but the reality is God by His Holy Spirit may be speaking and challenging you on purpose. When life is bitter, how will you survive when at times your survival is being challenged? Do you ever wonder how you're going to make it? Are you ever overwhelmed with the futility of going on? Are you ever weary in well-doing? Are you ever tempted to envy the world? To look at the temporal instead of the eternal? Are your trials and testings more than you can bear? Do you ever wonder, where is God in all this? <laughs> Are you ever disappointed in your relationships with others? Do you ever feel alone, rejected, or trapped? If any of these circumstances, if any of these circumstances, what keeps you from slipping, from giving up, from walking out, from blowing it? How will you survive when at times your very survival is being challenged? The secret is found in the sanctuary. A term I use because it is a metaphor used in the Old Testament for communing with God. When God told Moses to build the tabernacle, he gave him a blueprint patterned after the things in heaven. What you see is similar to that which is in heaven. So when you look at the tabernacle, you see something that's a lot like heaven. The temple, I'm not so sure. <laughs> he got a little carried away. He gave him a blueprint pattern after the things in heaven from Hebrews 8, 1 and 5. The tabernacle was to be a sanctuary where God would dwell among his people. Exodus 25, 8. God wanted his people to see that all of life was to be centered around communion with him. To meet with him, to talk with him, to daily share with him. Why? Because we need his perspective on life. And when we don't have it, when we walk in our own ways, we always end up in frustration, emptiness, confusion, dispersion, despair, desperation, destruction, death, and we just go D D D down, down, down. As I listen to others, as I share their lives, and as I review my own life, I am more and more convinced that the answers to our problems are not found in five easy steps or four principles of this or that or in positive confession or positive beliefs. Note that I said positive, not proper. But in intimate, knowledgeable relationship with our Father God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who sits at the right hand of the throne of God. I know in this generation of self-help, everybody wants to help self and they help themselves to what they can help themselves to so that they can self-help themselves right into something about self. Think about that. Replay the video and see if I got that one right. In the sanctuary, we gain a proper perspective of life, and God becomes our all in all. In Psalm 73, the psalmist tells us how envious and discouraging or discouraged he was when he looked at the apparent prosperity and ease of the wicked. Bitterness crept into his life until he went into the sanctuary of God. When my heart was embittered and I was pierced within, then I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. With your counsel, you will guide me and afterwards receive me to glory. 
Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Psalm 73, 21 through 26. You'll never really be able to handle the bitterness and disappointments of life until God himself becomes your all in all. Until you get along with God consistently, with your God regularly, until you constantly look to God whom you know, then you're going to be bitter. You won't feel and know and see things from his perspective. If you don't get along with him, the things of this life will always be out of perspective. In the sanctuary, we learn God's ways. The seeming iniquities or inequities of life, the ease of the wicked and the problems of the righteous, troubled the psalmist when he tried to understand them. Until I came into the sanctuary of God, then I perceived their end. We forget that there is an end to this life as we know it, and that what follows that end is judgment, everlasting, unending judgment for those who turn their back on God. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. Psalm 73, 27. Oh, how we need to see that thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Psalm 77, 13. In the sanctuary, we receive strength to go on. Have you ever thought it would be just easier to die? On a personal note, sure, I have. <laughs> and believe me, I got saved emotionally, born again, and was really way out there excitable and excited and joyful and walking in the spirit. And yet those times do come upon us all. The pressures of ministry were so great that it entered my mind one day. But because I live in the word, I knew that the thought was not from God. It was Satan's subtle seduction, his tactics as a murderer, John 8, 44. In the sanctuary of his presence, I received strength to go on, strength to resist, to persist, and to continue to be productive as a servant of the Most High God, El Elyon. What about you? Do you need strength? Remember, strength and beauty are in his sanctuary, Psalm 96, 6. In the sanctuary, we discover beauty, the beauty of his presence, the beauty of his person, the beauty of his purpose for your life, for our life. In the midst of all the ugliness of this world, of lives disfigured and distorted because of sin, we need beauty, real beauty. That factual beauty that comes from knowing God and seeing things from God's perspective. There's a beauty that comes from getting along, getting alone with God. Lines of stress, wrinkles of frustration, ceases of bitterness, creases of bitterness are lifted from your face as you quietly, unhurriedly sit before your God. Reading his word, stopping to pray as he speaks to your heart, sorting things out, confessing, unloading all your burdens and listening. There in his sanctuary, you gain assurance of his unlimited sovereignty and unconditional love. And it imparts a beauty to life, a beauty to you. Then you can walk out to meet your day, knowing that whatever happens, you can make it. Because you can say with the psalmist, as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge. You can stay as far away from God as you want or as near as you want. You can take him in every situation you want to or none. The choice is really up to you. My favorite expression that I've written all my life is, if you really want to be miserable, not only can you, you are. And God will allow you to be miserable and stay in your own mire of your own making if that's what you really want to do. That's not what he has intended for you. What he wants you to do is to seek him and to find that he loves you. But he also wants you to know that he's got joy, peace, love, beauty for ashes, a solution to your bitterness, a wrinkle remover for your age, <laughs> a sunblock for the sunburn. Now he just has got you in the palm of his hand and if he's squeezing you, just listen to him. He loves you. He knows what's best. Trust him.